Michael Collier talks with poet Ann Caston. Welcome to The Writing Life. Today, we're here to talk with the poet Ann Caston. Uh, Ann lives in Southern Maryland, where she's teaching at Charles Community College, as well as St. Mary's College. Uh, recently, her first book, Flying Out with the Wounded, was published. Uh, it was the winner of the 1997 New York University Prize, Press Prize for Poetry. And um, I met and several years ago at Warren Wilson College, where she was a student in the program for writers and working on her MFA degree. Um, it's been a pleasure to come back, uh, first through the work, through the, through the book, and now to sit at this table to hear you read and talk about the poems. Um, I thought maybe the best thing uh, to do is, is to get you introduced to the, the audience. And by doing that, uh, if you could read the first poem. Sure. in the book, Anatomy. Okay, sure. <clears throat> Anatomy. When Hal Pingle was 30 minutes late, I walked to the long windowed wall along the back of the anatomy lab and passed myself back and forth through the dull midwinter afternoon light, watching how the dust motes scattered, then closed again behind. Outside the snow had begun. The courtyard was a muffle of voices. In the unlit center of the room, a wheeled gurney, a cadaver covered with clear plastic. Even from a distance, I could make out the blue-gray shape of the man, the dark, massed areas of hair along his upper chest and groin, the long incision where he'd been opened at the morgue. I didn't want the first nude man I'd see to be dead. I didn't want to empty him out alone, piece by piece, his entrails, his heart. What I wanted was for my friend to arrive, to take up the instruments and begin the excisions, the litany of organs I would label and bag. Then together we'd examine the corridors leading to and from the faulty heart, make precise notes where the blood pooled in his body, what it drained away from. And so not to look at the gurney, I studied the instruments, steel calipers, thin cannulas, the razor-bright edges of scalpels. How sharp, I wondered, even as the fat pad of my left thumb opened and blood seeped out. At the pale blue door labeled supply in the back of the room, I put out my good hand and turned the handle. I heard the latch click. I heard the hinge complain. But I was watching my thumb separate and swell purple like a seam on a plum. When I did look up, I was inside. The closet lifted into long shelves where fetuses, for as far as I could see, swam in jars, yellowed, curled in on themselves. The door slammed shut behind me. I stood there in the crypt-like dark and felt what? Felt the silence entering my ear, felt a corridor opening in me, a corridor like knowing or the edge of knowing. Inside me, the seed of the tree of knowledge took root and began a furious blooming. I heard him come in, heard him call my name, heard him mutter to himself, heard him leave again. I heard a small noise that sounded like mice. The sleeve of my lab coat was sticky. I turned in the dark. I found the handle and opened the door. I stepped out, I didn't look back. I closed the blinds and locked the outer door. I turned off all the lights but one. Then I went to the gurney and pulled the covering off the man. I looked at him, at all of him. Nothing to distinguish him. No moles, tattoos, no birthmarks or scars. Only the incision running from sternum to pubic thicket. I couldn't tell clearly where the wound ended and the body began. I ran the seam of my thumb along the long open seam on the man. Here is where we meet, I told him. Here is where we are the same. 
It's a powerful poem. Thank um, you. <clears throat> it, what, what's striking about it to me is, is just the way the, the drama unfolds. We're always expecting <laughs> the, the, the man who's not there, <laughs> who you're supposed to meet and have this experience together, right. uh, step in and somehow mitigate <laughs> the, the difficulty of it. Right. And the, the, the other thing that is um, particularly powerful about it is just the way uh, you bring so many different kinds of metaphorical levels into it. There's, this entire poem can be read as a sexual encounter. Right. And um, it's also a poem, one of the things I, I'd be curious, there are a number of things I'd like for you to talk about in this poem, but one of the things that I'd be curious to, to hear you talk about is how it also describes the art of poetry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or, or, or what it is as a writer you, you find you're working towards uh, yeah. in a poem. Okay. Um, I think it is a sort of ars poetica, actually, about poetry. No, I do too. I, um, there are many things, particularly in my own experiences, I didn't want to face in poetry. I didn't think it was poetic material. I refused to sort of look at the same time that I had a morbid curiosity about mm. them. So I either had to look at all of it and use it in the poems, and use it, and encounter it firsthand, or I wasn't near the beast itself, you know, in the same way that coming close to the dead man meant uh, coming close to my own mortality, mm -hmm. coming close to what it is to be human, you know. There I was in a place where I was between both the bookends, those before life, which were in the jars, and and then the man on the table, which was after life. And here yeah. I was, the only living thing in the room, and I was wounded too. Yeah. So I think poetry sometimes feels like that moment feels. Uh -huh. I think that may be why it, it's captured something of uh, my struggle with poetry, my struggle with looking at everything with a straight eye. Uh -huh. Yeah, in, the, in those final li lines, here is where we meet, I told him. Here is where we are the same. Uh, th the fact that at some point, in, in the process of writing the poem, you have to I identify, you have to lose yourself right. in what you're looking at. Not right. so much the experience, but in what the experience has become yeah. in, the, in, in the poem. In the poem. Uh, th th this is a poem since I've first encountered it. I, I don't know how many times I've gone back to <laughs> it. Uh, I also love it as well because it has so many details in it. It's so vividly, <laughs> it's so vividly seen. Good. and uh, imagined. And, and, and that's, that's another thing about your poems is that it seems to me that they, they found a kind of idiom. Uh, and yeah. that's always the struggle when we're writing is, is, is what is the idiom we're going to find for our experience. Yeah. Uh, other people talk about it in terms of voice. Uh, but, but sometimes it gets down right to just the kind of language that, yeah. that, that's being used and uh, the world that can be said to, to describe. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, I know that many of these poems uh, in the first part of the book came out of your experience as a practical nurse. Right. And I was hoping you might read a few more of those and then perhaps talk a bit about the, the, experience, the experience, how those experiences, <laughs> okay. and, and really how they began to declare themselves to be poems. Okay. And one I had picked out, if it's okay, is sure. Flying Out with the Wounded, oh, which good. is the title poem. Yeah. That is, is really, um, as far as the poems go, that's one of the last ones that was written in this section, strangely. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, the, I wouldn't, the, have, the I wouldn't have thought that. Yeah. <laughs> it took me a long time to get to this one. This one was actually sort of my confession uh -huh. as a nurse, as a poet, as a woman, that um, there were some patients I didn't, like very well. I didn't necessarily want to save them, but your obligation as mm -hmm. a nurse is to do what you can. Mm -hmm. right. So at some level you disconnect from who you are as a human and you connect with another level of humanness, which is that professional level of uh -huh. what you have to do next. First you click off this and this and this in order to save someone's life. There's a right. process you go through. Um, and I think that works um, with, the, with the poem too. At some level Anne Caston leaves the work and it takes on its own identity. I become the writer. Yeah. But it's almost a, a sieve. It's almost, again, that they merge. Um, but I wrote this one mainly as a confession to get it off uh -huh. my chest and to see how far a reader would let me go. Uh -huh. So I'll just read the poem. Okay. Flying out with the wounded. When the lightning struck, trees blackened against a silver sky and the river bruised. 
the undersides of clouds wounding its surface. But this was not my work. My work, pressed into the dark hold of the chopper, was a drunk man, foul and fuming, restrained against his drunkenness, his abdomen packed with gauze to staunch the bleeding, and his head on victims, a woman and a girl whose head had been bandaged to keep the brain intact. The girl was dead. We lifted off with our cargo. There were scant inches in which to crouch. Jack had to ride in front. I was airsick and praying that the snarl of blades overhead wouldn't snag in the electric night. Somewhere between that stretch of sky and Birmingham, the man caught sight of the woman and girl. God damn, he said, God damn, gooks. And then to me, and Nam, we used to throw them out, watch them splatter. He laughed and laughed to himself. The woman flinched. She turned her face from him, went back to stroking the girl's cheek. The girl's gaze was fixed. Still the woman was making the shushing sound. I leaned over the man. Shut up, I said close to his ear so he would hear me over the noisy blades. Shut up or I will push you out. He quieted then and I sat back to ride the air sickness in me out. Can I tell you I liked thinking about pushing him out? Can I say... I was imagining how easy it would be for me to roll the man out into the rumble of thunder and the whirring blades. I was. But then he seized. He arched against his bonds. His eyes rolled back to white. I straddled the man. I called out for help. Jack grabbed the ambu bag and started the count. I placed my hands, palms down, against that spot, two fingers' breadth from the tip of the sternum. I pushed. The man's wound gushed wet and warm against my thighs. The smell of blood thickened. I wanted to lift myself from him. Still, I pushed the man's heart to respond. Still, Jack counted. Still, the ambu bag wheezed in and out. We worked like that the whole way in, and when we landed, someone else took over. They lifted him away. I stepped out to catch a mouthful of wet, clean air, to drive the blood-drunk smell of him from my lungs. I looked down then and saw myself, bloodied where I had straddled the man as if I had just given birth. Um, another powerful poem with a, a terrifying <laughs> ending, the transformation of you into... Uh, someone who's just given birth. <laughs> but uh, you know what else is also interested, uh, interesting about this poem, and I hadn't thought about it the other times I had read it, is really how you, ha the speaker in the poem, has to become the man, right. has, has, has to have the same thoughts that the man has in order and somehow to overcome and, and, and then uh, literally, in some ways, take him in and give him birth right. and give birth to him or his ilk or his kind yeah. and it's only it's only then that in the final image which which seems at first um, to be way outside <laughs> the poem I'm sure but but actually it's it, it's the thing that makes makes the poem work oh, it, to, to me and it happens it, after the line when you say when we landed someone else took over it works both ways right. you know someone else literally but also someone other than 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 you because right. you've transformed or the speaker's transformed sure. utterly in, in, into this other thing. I'm also wondering about the form. This is one of the, f <laughs> maybe it's the only poem in the book that is really in prose. prose right. it, in terms of confronting the material, <laughs> looking at the beast, did, did it not seem to be, tame not, not that there's anything wrong with the prose poem, <laughs> right. but did it not seem to be tameable in, uh, in another form? Well, it actually began in a journal, as most of these poems did, from the days when I was doing this. I would go home in the morning, and after I did breakfast and got the uh -huh. children settled, I would write about what had happened. So it began in a journal, and I thought, well, can I make a poem of this? And I kept trying to shape it into those shapely stanzas and lines, and it was unruly. Uh -huh. You know, I thought, well, it, I wasn't sure it was a poem anyway. It sounded like a little story. Right. 
although it was dense with language and imagery, which is sort of what I think of as a poem. And I thought, well, we're just all mixed up, so it's going to be a prose poem. Uh -huh. And really, I wanted it to be mimetic of paragraphs, of a mm -hmm. story, of something that would make a reader's eye fall comfortably on the page, as if he or she were listening to a story. Mm -hmm. It seemed the way to put it, and so uh -huh. I left it like that. Uh -huh. it, it, one thing that I think it does uh, for me as a reader is it um, lessens the tendency of something this dramatic to become melodramatic. Right, you know, which it, is it, always the difficulty. Yeah, it, it, it puts some pressure against, against that. Sure. So um, how long ago did this take place? I'm interested in, the, in your process uh -huh. of writing. How long ago did this, did this <laughs> event, event or, or the skeleton uh -huh. of the event or whatever take place? In uh, let's see, it was probably 1978. Mm -hmm. So almost 20 almost, years almost ago. Almost 20 years. And, you, and, and in that time, fr or from that time, or since that time, you've always written in notebooks? I've done that since I could write. Oh, is that right? Yeah. When yeah. I couldn't write, I just kept it in my head and babbled a lot. Uh -huh. So for whatever reason, putting something on the page was crucial to me being able to see it, Right. to remembering it. Now, when, when we first met, you weren't writing these kinds of poems. No. They were very, they were very different. In fact, they were poems that didn't have much incident right. uh, in, in, in them. Which what, is, for what, some what reason, happened? what I thought a poem was. I thought it had to be very artsy. It had to be like a little puzzle that uh -huh. only smart people could figure out. A kind oh, of riddle. So embarrassing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you know, I think it was important to go through that phase because what I learned <clears> to do was to make each word have some muscle. Uh -huh. I was working with tightly sculpted little lyrics, you know, things that alluded to something but didn't directly confront it, right. which wouldn't have worked with this material, uh -huh. obviously. This is much more volatile material. So I learned for a little bit of time how to compress language. Um, and then I came back to the work, to the, the life, mm -hmm. and tried to do something with it. And it certainly wasn't going to be amenable to that kind of shape. Yeah. Did you think when you were making those other poems that did you have these experiences in mind somehow, or were they completely, was, um, was it completely impossible for you to think of as, as, as poetry? These poems here? Yes. Oh, oh no, the incidents. Oh, the incident. The incidents. Um, no, I really didn't, I think at that point I didn't know where poetry came from. I see, yeah. You know, I had sort of been shaped by school experiences, and I mean very long ago school experiences. of. It's Arbor Day, let's write, a, let's write a poem about a tree. And uh -huh. so much of what I wrote early on were rhymed and metered sonnets right. because that's what I knew, quatrains. Um, I moved away from that into free verse, blank verse. Mm -hmm. And what you saw the first semester at graduate school was the first movement away from rhymed and metered poetry. Uh -huh. So I was really limping, really staggering around. Yeah. Nothing felt right. Uh -huh. um, but. I also am a desperate woman, and so I wanted very much to uh, be able to articulate what I had seen mm -hmm. and what I had participated in. I had been shaped utterly by the experiences of my life, particularly with working with the wounded and dying. Right. Um, I put my hands on things that I became somehow. Yeah. The, the veil between you and I is very thin, you know? Yeah. And I think working hands-on with the bodies of my patients, there were times when I felt as if I were a part of them uh -huh. and, I, and that I never left without taking something of them with me. Uh -huh. So they were there. They were indelible. They were a very strong part of who I was, and I wasn't touching that in poetry. I didn't really know how to, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Is there, is there a poem in here in which you, you felt you first began to touch that to come in contact with it? Is it a poem like When, when I Am Not Telling It? Is, yeah. that, is that a poem like I that? Oh, that was definitely one of the first ones I wrote. Um, shall I read that one? Yeah, why, okay, why don't let you me read it. it. It's I'll, one of my favorite poems. Then I'll poems talk now. about it okay. a little bit. Let's see. Um, I grew up, as I said before, in the Deep South, and that's a place of silences. I knew early on what I was and was not supposed to say and do and think and be. And if you don't play by the rules, you're punished for it, you know. So after a while, what I heard all my life was, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. So <laughs> I was utterly in silence. <laughs> <laughs> I right. didn't know how to say anything nice <laughs> about what <laughs> I saw. Say nothing good. 
<laughs> to remark on. That's right. I had a grandmother who told me the family stories. Thank God, because my father wanted just to forget what he had come from. Uh -huh. But I had this real subversive grandmother who played the fiddle in a country western hoedown band and painted her fingernails red and divorced in the 30s when it was unheard of. And um, So she would tell me the family stories, and uh -huh. what she told me was that her father had witnessed his father being lynched as a small boy. Uh -huh. And it was something that no one would speak about because of the shame attached to it was that um, his father had married a French Creole woman, uh -huh. meaning she had mixed blood, and had taken her to Arkansas to farm with the other Irish part of his family. And the neighbors found out one day uh -huh. that his wife was French Creole. And they lynched him in the fields uh -huh. after they made him build his own scaffold. And God. for seven days, they circled the wagon and would not let anybody cut him down until literally he had fallen off the bone. That was their way of punishing him. So here are these great stories, right. you know, tragic, terrible stories. These are the people I come out of, you know, but mm -hmm. my grandmother hadn't been allowed to speak of them. My father wouldn't. And I thought, well, you know, it dies with me. Yeah. If, it, if it doesn't get spoken, it doesn't happen. In the South, so I wrote. Did, did you start? Let me <laughs> Go ahead. Just, did you did you start writing about the same time your your grandmother started to tell you stories? Um, probably. Uh -huh. Very young, very young. And she's. I mean, this is how I got it. So I would write it down. So you felt the trans. You felt the transfer sure. already. I knew better than to tell anybody else what she told right. me. Yeah. So the page was the listening ear. So that's where I went, and still go. Uh -huh. I mean, it's an old habit. So here's the point: when I am not telling it. Somewhere in history, a woman is tying on her apron just at the moment the rough hemp rope is knotted fast around her husband's neck. The snap as it takes the man's full weight and the brief and elegant steps of his feet in midair, this is someone else's story. And the child with gala's dreams, the woman's child who would be my great-grandfather waking the household nightly crying, Papa, oh my Papa. This, too, is someone else's story. But this silence, which is the long silence of my life, out of which the story rises when it rises, and to which the story returns when I am not telling it, this is my story, as is the old knock and shove of my heart around it and my love of grudges. To begin with an apron and end with a hanging, crying between, this is a story I know well enough to tell. So it really is a kind of de <laughs> declaration of how you're going to proceed. I think so. Yeah. I think so. Did, were you tempted to put that, that poem first? Um, I did, you, actually, you did. for yeah. a long time. Uh -huh. I, I, it sort I, of announced itself, you know, and then I thought, oh, no. Yeah, it's, 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 a, yeah, it's a kind of credo. It's, I think it's better that it's buried here a little bit yeah. or, or introduces us to the second section, second which really section. is about, uh, has a lot of the family poems right. In, right. in them. And um, it's it's stronger for that. Oh, good. I, I really love the line, "The long silence of my life." Yeah. And um, the, you know, the poems the poems themselves work against the silence. Of course, <laughs> it becomes very ironic. It is. <laughs> it is. Has your cake and eat it too? <laughs> yeah, especially by the time we get here. Sure. Um, and but but also there's the poem about um, uh, coming on coming. Finding the lynching. Oh, right. Later on, which which right. now this poem, I, I I didn't know exactly how to read this that poem, poem against that right. poem. Right. And now it it uh, creates a kind of resonance. And yeah. that discovery of that lynching must have been, which is a different lynching. A different lynching, different, right? Entirely different kind, different. yeah. Wow. Must have been very powerful. Know, it was. Knowing the family story. It was terrifying, I think. Um, I thought things like that didn't happen in the 70s mm -hmm. in Jacksonville, Florida. You know, I grew up believing that that South was somewhere else. It was Birmingham or it was Mississippi uh -huh. or it was Georgia, but it wasn't in Florida. Yeah. You know, the history books and the teaching of the history was was that we were we were just much better than that. Now we're this was you know, after 1964, after yeah. the Civil Rights Act had been passed, there was this polite veneer over everything. Right. So I didn't expect it. I had bought the lie, you know. And so stumbling into that, um, not just the lynching itself, but the conversations afterwards by the policeman let me know this was common occurrence uh -huh. still. 
It yeah. may yet be. I hope not, but I, I certainly think it I may be. I hope not, be. but it was, it was terrifying. Let's see if we have time for a final poem. Okay. Gardens? Sure. This is the last poem of the book. In the book, right. Uh, the poem is dedicated to Jody Mahoney, who is a friend of mine, mentioned in the poem, Who Got Cancer. Gardens. The other's hour's gone, and I am left again mid-morning to swept floors, to dishes racked and drying, to the old hum and order of a house, and this day turning like the morning's laundry in a hot dryer. Outside, the first green grasses struggle with dandelions between the flagstones, and the long beds of mud and mulch lie empty still, hand-tilled and turned for planting weeks ago. Somewhere this morning, on the far edge of the continent, you are under the knife and needle, and I am here, years past trying to save anyone, past even believing that I can. Because it is the only answer I have to the darkness that being mortal is, to loving what is also mortal and being done in, I spend the morning on my knees, pushing dormant bulbs into the earth, trying to go so deep that I'm deeper in than the palpable ache of the day, the fist of fear clenching and unclenching in me. I remember again the man who brought a, pot, a plot of land that had been a battleground, how he went on planting it for years, though only weeds came up and bitter waters after rain. By afternoon, sun spills through the back windows, and the English ivy and creepers turn in their ceramic pots, swiveling to embrace in a few hours' time what has fallen over them. The wandering Jew, too, turns from the exile of its corner. Under the iron's heat, the starchy sweet scent of my husband rises from his shirt so strong I have to put the iron down and press my face into the cloth, give myself over to what both is and is not there. Beyond me, on the back deck, the window box dahlia blooms and a stray calico moves along the wood's weedy edge. I take it in and in. The gardens, the woods, the vacant beds, the sun and soil, there is never too much, never enough. Um, in placing that poem last, it, it goes back and, <laughs> and pulls in, I think, many of the concerns in, in the poem. And the ending of, of, of the poem is powerful because of its praising affect. There is never too much, never, never, never. enough. <laughs> It's a wonderful po poem. Thank you so much. I've, I've enjoyed this. Thank you, Mike. Uh, to, to hear the poems and to hear you talk about them. And thank you for joining us today on The Writing Life. I think we did it right that time. <laughs> <laughs>